next speaker is my friend Harley, Harley Melifont. So Harley's a front-end engineer. Um, he's built video streaming services, interactive documentaries, graphic design tools uh, while working at SBS, and then we work together at Canva. Uh, but at night, he becomes a musician, so a nice transition from our last talk. Um, he works with music, signal processing, and 3D graphics in exploring the novel ways in which music and art can interact. Uh, so please welcome Harley. Thanks. Um, so yeah, the title of my talk is If I Were a Pixel, What Would I Do? Uh, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Pixel Shaders. Um, and the reason for that is that pixel shaders are essentially thinking like a pixel, or something along those lines at least. It's the decision process of like, how am I going to choose to color this pixel on the screen? Um, and it, it's kind of surprising actually. Like if you look at this scene that I created here, um, it's, it's fairly complex. You've got like a landscape and clouds and stars and a sunset and that kind of thing. Um, but I made this in a Sunday afternoon and that might, might be a bit surprising, but uh, I want to take you through some of the techniques that you actually go with, can use to produce graphics like these. Um, and I think that once you get past a certain stage of understanding, then doing things like this becomes incredibly easy. So, yeah, so the purpose of this talk is to just introduce pixel shaders and the OpenGL uh, shading language, also known as GLSL, um, to provide an intuitive understanding of 3D graphics algorithms. So, um, so you might not get all the details, but if you can kind of gain an intuition on how this is done, then that's, that's what I want you to take away from this. Um, and to demonstrate that it's easier than you might expect to create complexity from simplicity. Um, so first up is thinking like a pixel. Um, so pixel shader, like I said, it runs on the GPU and its purpose is just to calculate an RGBA color value. That's all it does. Uh, so if you're familiar with like the C programming languages, it should look immediately obvious to you. Uh, we've got this type here called a VEC4 that's basically an array of four numbers, essentially. Um, and so this, this vector is basically producing the color output when I assign it to the GL frag color. Um, I can actually change this in real time and kind of um, just explore different color options, but it's not especially interesting when you're only looking at one color, right? Um, so that's just the, the beginning point of your shading. Um, but it takes all kinds of pixels to make a world, and how do you know which pixel is which if this is the same code that runs on for every single pixel on the screen? Um, shaders have two kinds of inputs. They have varying inputs, which for each pixel will have, have a unique input. And then they have uniform inputs, which for all pixels, they receive the same input data. Um, so a good example is the GL frag chord. So that, that tells you your current XY coordinate for your pixel. And if you input into the shader the resolution of the screen, then you can kind of divide your frag coordinate by the resolution of the screen to find out where you are on that, that screen. In a, in a normalized grid between 0 and 1. Um, so in this example, um, I'm just taking the, the frag coordinate to generate the, the R and the G colors. And then the blue, I just use a sine wave with a time input to kind of fade the blue in and out. And you just get like a little bit of variation. That's how you kind of know where you are when you're in a pixel shader. Um, that's kind of interesting, but like you can't really do too much with that. Well, I'm sure you can, but you know it's it's just early days yet. So, so how do you make shapes with these kinds of algorithms? So, um, we should all be fairly familiar with like uh, like how to find the length of a point from origin. So, x, the square root of x squared plus y squared. Um, so, to do a circle, you're basically just saying my my shape is described by the length of this point from origin, as long as it's less than the radius, then you're in the circle, you're there. Um, so if I look at my circle function here, that's what, what that is. We've basically got this great built-in function that'll calculate the length of a point. So it just like abstracts away all the details, super easy to work with. And then we've got a step function that says, um, so if this argument is greater than the second argument, it returns zero, otherwise it returns one. So that's how we know we're in our circle. Um, if we take that, though, 
take the tint that we had from the last slide and take the shape that we've created with a radius of 0.8. If we multiply them together, then we are tinting our circle. So this is just like the kind of decision making that you go into creating shapes and creating colors and gradients and that sort of thing. Um, so the thing about pixel shaders that's kind of a little bit different to the way you'd normally program things is that loops are expensive. Um, because you want to put all those pixels on the screen, you want to put them on the screen at the same time. Otherwise, you end up with tearing and all kinds of weird, weird artifacts. Um, so loops are best to be avoided when you're working with pixel shaders. Sometimes you'll need them, but try to minimize them. And you can get away with it by uh, taking your space, your x, y, like between 0 and 1. Um, if you scale that space up, but then take the fractional component, you can just repeat the space. So at very low cost, I can take that circle that I made before, and I can just repeat the space and have like as many circles as I want. So if I wanted to, I could go in and like change this number here, for instance, and just have a lot more circles. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's how you can get away with um, oops. Yeah, that's how you can get away with um, avoiding looping with a really, really quick method. Um, but if you use the floor function, so if you remember the fract function, you're just taking the fractional part of your, your number. The floor function, you're taking the integer along the grid. And so you could use that to manipulate the different cells on the grid so you can get variation in your repetition as well. Um, so these are some of the basic tools that you start to use. And just from these alone, you can start to make really, really complex things. Um, but we kind of want to take it to the next level. That's just kind of 2D graphics. Um, 2D graphics are fun. I've done lots of like fractals and all that kind of stuff in the past. And you can create really interesting things, but they generally become very abstract quite quickly. Unless, of course, you're using neural networks and art. Then it's really interesting. But um, 3D is the kind of stuff that I'm really interested in. and I'm, I, became interested a couple of years ago in how do you do these algorithms? How does, what's behind making a 3D scene? Um, so the two techniques that I came across uh, that are very surprisingly simple for making 3D graphics, one is that you have distance fields, and the other is ray marching. And these are kind of two tools that you can use to create really interesting 3D graphics. Um, and yeah, you can just see an example here. We've just got a sphere, nothing particularly interesting, but yeah. So about distance fields, so a distance field takes a point in some kind of like 2D or 3D or 4D, however many dimensions of space, and returns a scalar value back, telling you how far away you are from something. Um, so in this example that I've got here, you can see that it gets darker and darker and darker up until this line here. So this is the zero point of the distance field. And my distance field is like morphing between a circle and a square. Um, so at this point here, we know that we're touching the surface of our distance field. And it, this, this other colored part inside, the gray color, that means that we're going into negative values now. We're, going, we're less than zero. We're inside whatever object we've got. Um, and I'll actually just quickly like jump over and kind of show you. You don't necessarily need to come up with all the shapes on your own. There's heaps of really good resources. Um, you can just kind of like go and find how to make various shapes. Uh, there's also a lot of techniques for combining different shapes. Um, so like just look them up and use them. It's, it's super easy once you've got that going. Um, and so the next part we want to do is we want to set the scene. We want to like create a 3D scene. We're actually having uh, we're, we're modeling some 3D space, and we need to project it onto a 2D surface. So how do we do that? Well, we, we, we have a camera. We decide where are we going to put our camera. Uh, in the case of this screen, it's kind of a good idea. Like, you use the z-axis as depth. So you place the camera behind the screen. And that's your origin. That's in, it, it's actually kind of funny with these algorithms, because in the real world, light is emitted from a source and bounces around a whole bunch of times, and then you receive it in your eye. But what we do with computer graphics is we do it in reverse, because otherwise it would be far too expensive. So we shoot rays out from the eye, the camera, and then we see what it intersects with. Um, so this is what we do. We decide where we're going to place our, ca our camera, and we just use a three-part vector to place it in 3D space. 
Um, and then we shoot from the ray origin through our pixel coordinate. And from the, the ray origin and the, origin, the, the coordinate of the pixel, we can calculate the, direc the direction of that ray. Um, so in GLSL, this is just these three lines. Whoops. Um, these three lines here. So the focal length, um, if I was to change that to one, it's going to be a weird fisheye kind of view. It's going to look really bizarre. But two is kind of a pretty good focal length in general. Uh, then we've got our ray origin, which is just like placing the camera at one, minus one in depth. And then our ray direction, we just subtract our pixel coordinate at the zero depth. And, and for, uh, the, the ray origin times by the fo focal length, we, we subtract that from our pixel coordinate. Um, so that's all you have to do to set up your most simple camera. Um, but you can get a lot more complex than that. You can have like crazy matrices and rotations and all this kind of stuff. This is just to get you started. Um, and so the next technique is ray marching. So ray marching is you basically, you've got your, your origin, you've got your direction, and then you just kind of step it forward, 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 forward until it hits your scene. Um, so I've got my kind of cool little house on a hill thing. Uh, and I step my ray closer and closer, and once I've intersected the house, then I'm done. That's, that's what ray marching is. You're finding out when you're going to hit your geometry. Um, ray marching isn't especially efficient. There's some optimizations you can do, but it's really good if you want to do sort of volumetric things. So you imagine clouds that are kind of translucent or have, you know, not, not completely opaque. Uh, if you're integrating from the point of the ray origin to the point at which it becomes opaque, then you can kind of see depth to things. But you can kind of optimize ray marching um, with a technique called sphere tracing, which is really, really useful if you want to just render solid shapes. So you use sphere tracing um, to like speed up the number of, or reduce the number of steps that it takes to hit your um, geometry. So in this case, we take the distance field that we have before, and at step one, we calculate how far the distance is. And then we move our ray closer by that amount. So this is the distance to the geometry. This is the direction that we move it. We move it by that space. And we know once we get there, OK, um, let's check again how we hit our geometry. And so we, we calculate. We run the distance field again. OK, it's, it's that far away. Let's move it closer to here. Um, and you kind of keep iterating until you intersect your geometry. But you can generally reduce the number of iterations significantly with sphere tracing. So it's actually really, really useful if you want to have performant, like real-time 3D graphics. Uh, so in, in GLSL, this is the ray marching function. We've just got a for loop. So we start with a current distance of 0 and a total distance of 0. And we have an upper limit to how far we want to march our ray before we go, eh, I'm not going to hit anything. Um, so we're just kind of looping. And we, we calculate our current distance from our distance field, which is just a sphere. Uh, then we increment our total distance. And we break the loop. If, we've, if we're less than or equal to 0, then we've intersected. If we've gone too far, then don't keep going. You know, just give up on it. Um, and that's it. That's all you have to do. Uh, so the next part is lighting and shading. So once you get to this stage, um, you've intersected your geometry. Now what you need to do is you need to calculate the normal vector. So the normal vector is like the, the surface of your shape. You want to calculate what, what's perpendicular to that point on the surface. So in this case here, we've got um, this point here. And that's the normal vector once that ray is intersected. Um, and then to do lighting, you take the direction of your light source and you compare it with the, the normal vector. Um, and you can see this, this equation here. Essentially, you're doing a dot product of these, the normal and the light direction vectors, which is basically just the same as a cosine theta function. So when the angle, um, when the angle is 0, you've got 1. You've got like maximum intensity of your light. And at a right angle, the, you're going to end up with 0 out. Uh, so that's how you shade the surface of your geometry. Um, yeah, so as you can see, as the angle gets lighter, the color on the, um, the, color on the sphere is going to get darker. Uh, and this like a really intuitive example is just to think about the moon. It's a really good example of Lambert shading. Obviously, there's some cool textures and patterns and stuff that are very rich. But um, it's a very intuitive way of thinking about Lambert shading. Um, so in GLSL, what does that look like? 
We've got a light color, which in this case is just one. We've got a position of our light, which is basically um, above and behind the camera. Um, and then we've got the direction of our light, which we calculate from the position of the light and the point that we're of interest, uh, or the point that our uh, ray is at. And then to calculate our Lambert shading, we, we calculate the dot product of the normal and the light direction. And we clamp that between 0 and 1 so that we don't, we don't end up going out of bounds. Um, and then we mix the ambient color that we want for our scene with the light color at the intensity of the shading. And that's how you make that sphere. That's, that's all it's doing. Um, but how do we go from spheres to sunsets? I mean, it's kind of a bit basic, but I think once you get past part, to the part of understanding how to do a sphere, um, it's actually not that much of a jump, really. And, and you'll be surprised. Um, so the next part is like we have uh, uh, fractal noise. This is like the secret source of making really, really rich geometry, making things look like natural landscapes. So I've just got a really primitive noise texture. But if I sum the noise at different octaves and different frequencies, or different octaves of the noise at different amplitudes and frequencies, then I can create more and more rich um, noise. And it starts to look a little bit more like a cloud now, but that's just a really small, simple texture added to itself at different frequencies and amplitudes. And you can just take this stuff and apply it to your geometry to make really, really interesting shapes. So we go back to our sphere, and if you look at my sphere function here, I basically got, um, I'm adding some, some noise to it from my point. Just a tiny bit of it, though. Like I, I just add a tiny little bit, bit of noise to the surface, and it kind of looks pretty interesting. But you can also do some pretty interesting stuff where, like, um, if you put noise inside your noise, then like you get some really interesting shapes, almost kind of like turbulent shapes. So you start getting these, these shapes to your um, like weird kind of cloud shapes, all kinds of stuff like that. And it's just like, put your function in your function. Hey, off you, off you go. Um, and what if you just add time to that? Well, it ends up becoming a lot more interesting. This is starting to look kind of like a planet. And if I go and play with the color, of this thing, maybe it'll look like us, maybe it'll look like something else. So you can, you can just take noise and make a sphere look really interesting that easily. It's, it's loads of fun. Um, so yeah, wow, noise is really powerful. Um, what if I make my own noise? I mean, I make noises all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Why not just like make some and see what happens? So, um, so I also write music and I became interested in this idea of how I can make music and visuals interact with one another. Um, so this is just a track that I've written. I'm playing kind of from the midway point. And I'm generating a noise texture from the music. And I'm using that to feed my, my shader. And th this this shader is basically created from just having a plane deformed by noise. And the clouds, they're basically the, the, the noise inside the noise creating these patterns in the sky and then manipulating with, with time. But it's kind of interesting that you end up with like this sort of emergent complexity when you take the sound from your music and you create a texture from it and then you feed it into your shader. Um, every single time I do this, it's different. It's kind of perplexing because you're dealing with randomness. So sometimes it looks really cool, sometimes it looks less cool. Um, but like, yeah, you, I try to like manipulate the randomness so that it always looks good. But it kind of varies all the time. And you end up with this kind of system that just kind of does its own thing and creates its own kind of landscape. But the cool part is that it kind of just moves in time to the music and that it kind of it's actually quite a simple idea, really. It's not as complex as it looks. We've created the complex by recursively making noise, essentially. Um, so I'll just let this play through a bit.
So that was just like an interesting thought experiment of like, what if I just made my own noise and manipulated it dynamically and created some kind of motion and movement from that? Um, so what are the main takeaways? Well, you can do a lot with just a pixel shader. You don't even have to look at the full GPU rendering pipeline. There's a lot more to it. But with just a pixel shader, you can create a 3D scene. Uh, with distance fields, they're basically like the vectors of geometry. Like most 3D graphics, you'll use a mesh and just like have points everywhere. And it's very meticulous to create it. Uh, with distance fields, you're dealing with pure mass. And so you're dealing with very discrete um, descriptions of things. And so what happens with that is you create this kind of emergent complexity. Some people use these techniques and they use physics equations, for example, Rayleigh scattering, which describes the way light scatters through the sky to create sunsets and things like that. And, and I was looking at these examples and going like, how did you make it look that realistic and beautiful? Because I have spent a lot of time trying to find the right colors and do all this kind of thing. But actually, when you just use the physics equations, the right colors fall out like magic, and it's just like you, it, you've got this discrete, tiny little example to create something as beautiful as an Earth, for instance. Um, and the, the really interesting part is because you've got this discrete amount of data, like the output is many orders of magnitude higher than the code that generates it. So that was only kilobytes of code, but it generates gigabytes of visual output, uh, which is a really interesting kind of property. Um, so with that, uh, if you were a pixel shader, what would you do? So hopefully, this kind of demystifies all of that kind of thing, and maybe you can kind of pick it up and approach it for yourself. Um, you can add me on social media. I've got my SoundCloud and my shader toy account if you kind of want to have a look at how the Sunset shader works. The code's a bit messy. It's just like I go in and tweak things, and you know, but you can just comment things out to understand what each part does. And if you want more resources, I really recommend checking out Inigo Quiles. Uh, he's got a lot of great tutorials on this stuff. Um, the Book of Shaders will give you a much more in-depth view of how to deal with shaders and how to create noise. And this uh, tutorial here on YouTube, uh, it's completely mind-blowing. You can create entire cities using sign distance functions with enormous um, emergent complexity um, just from simple rules. And it's surprising because for the, the, the artist, it's linear combining these functions, but the output is exponential. The complexity gets uh, richer quicker than you would anticipate. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>Thank you so much, Harley. Um, oh, we don't really have time for questions because we're going to get Mark up for the next talk before, uh, before the lunch break, but Harley will be here, so save your questions for the lunch break for him. Thank you again, Harley. Thanks.